as one. You can't download just the entire everything you turn in. Uh, but was it really a hassle for people? No. no. It was so easy. I, didn't know it. It was exactly I still don't know what I'm doing. Okay. But so the the solution because this way it's on our server in a directory where I can just go in there and uh, or the TA is grading and say, Oh, I want to look at this person's solution. You just go into the directory, if it's a Python file, you run it, you look. Uh, but I, I'm open to suggestions. Um, so what I think I should have my best friend Chris so that he yeah, what I guess I should have done is just shown you guys how to do it because yeah. I think it's really, really easy. Can you do that right now? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Please do. Okay. You know, uh, I was getting intermittent errors just even accessing UMN web pages, but it seemed to work for a lot of people. I logged in made a directory and then I showed SCP. I said no permission denied. Well, maybe I could have typed the password in wrong, but that means I would have like, typed it in wrong a bunch of times. A bunch of times. So, okay. well, we'll give it a I'll, I'll try again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm running Windows. That's Clearly, Go straight to my other That's what I needed. But I can fix it. He's good with that. It's um, uh, a lot of people who use that. He knows how to use the terminal. I'll level it up next. That's weird. It's time to start. Two thirty.
know how it works. Thank you have to get out of it. We did. You got, you got that no, there's a whole different thing. Thank you. No, we got out of it. We went back to like our home screen and filed the same. And then we like tried to do it and it's like, Okay, uh, regarding the code submission, my, the intent was not to complicate your lives here. It was, uh, I thought, vastly simpler to do it this way. Um, but some of you, I, many of you succeeded. So um, for those of you who didn't succeed, Alex, uh, how can I help you? Just uh, begin to prompt me, what was the stumbling block? Um, first, I didn't know uh, to use SSH. I thought you were telling me to log into your little wiki on there. I know, a lot of people assume that, apologies. So the idea is this was not login information for the website. It was uh, a place where you could upload your files. Yeah, go ahead. So after that, uh, I saw your second email. I was able to make my own directory. Uh, yeah. I could get uh, the PCSP command to work. SCP. I'm using Windows currently. I have to use PSCP. Or do I have to yeah. still use PuTTY? It, it depends which terminal program you use. Putty. If you use PuTTY, it's just SCP, right? It's yeah. SCP? Yeah. Oh. Uh, let, let me step you guys through it. So uh, obviously, it's going to be on a Windows machine. Here is a terminal on a Windows machine, uh, on a Mac. Uh, on a Mac. Uh, the instructions are log in to the website. So. Uh, the command from the terminal is SSH, which stands for Secure Shell. Then you give the username at the machine. The machine is an IP address. It gets translated to an IP address. Um, after you do that, it prompts you for the password, which uh, I tried to encrypt in the email I sent. But then in the complaining emails that people answered, the password was printed in the email about 15 times. So uh, it was lowercase. EE 5393. That's terrible handwriting. So the password is EE 5393. And then this room, which is 3230. OK. So it'll take me five attempts to type that in correctly. OK, so then you're logged on to the machine uh, in this global account. Here are, here's, here are the names and the directories of everybody who succeeded with the task. Uh, for you, if you haven't succeeded in this task, first create a directory for yourself. The command for that is make directory uh, blow.jo. So now the directory is made for blow.jo. Uh, now, exit from the machine. Uh, but this wasn't meant to be crass. This is the generic Joe Blow is the generic. But, it's, but this, in a previous generation, was the way to refer to a generic person. So I'm not saying anything wrong. <laughs> Joe Blow, Jane Doe, this is what, uh, so in the morgue, when there's uh, an unidentified corpse, this is what they're called. OK, so now. Uh, so suppose that I've got my code, which is called code.c. That's a file. Uh, from the terminal, I do scp secure copy code.c to ee5393 at caledrize.edu in the directory blow.jo. Does it matter where on my computer yes. Uh, code C is? Yes. So uh, you have to, uh, if code.c is on your desktop, then on a Mac machine, you could uh, change the directory in the terminal to your desktop. So desktop. Now you're on the directory desktop. Here are the files that I have on my desktop. If your code is on the desktop, then change to the directory 
uh, into which your uh, files are located and copy them to EE5393. Okay, it copied it, and so now it's in the directory. Uh, any questions on this? Please, I'm not trying to uh, make this uncomfortable with people who don't know this particular language. Yes, Ron. Uh, what does touch do? Oh, oh, that was just my way of creating a dummy file. Let's say Unix command that creates a, a file that contains nothing. So that I copy. Yes, Ryan. Uh, not a question, but kind of a plug. There's a program called MOBA X10 where you can just like type in the SSH username and password, and then the whole file directory of the server will pop up, so you can just drag your files in. Okay, that sounds good. There's probably dozens of them for Windows. There's FileZilla and others, other ways of doing this. Yes, Jordan. As an overall comment, I think we met most difficulty with this was trying to go into it from a Windows machine. Yeah, but I agreed. Uh, if, you, if you have a terminal or a Linux machine, you succeeded. Yes, Mackenzie? Um, Michelle and I were doing it last night from the lab computers, yeah. and like we got to the... Like we made our directories and then we did the SCP command, but then it gave us the error that the like the EE5393 Cali slash my name could not be found. But like my like my directory's up there. I made a directory. I, I saw your directory, yeah, and it's, it's still not working. Yeah, and so in the middle of the night, I had troubles accessing anything. It kind of happened intermittently. T uh, try again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, e email me if it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah. And like I mean, don't worry. Just. Uh, I don't want this to be complicated for people. Uh, and yeah, why don't you use the Moodle? It's just I know that's what I guess I should. That's what I guess I should do last time. But as I explained to Alex, uh, it creates an extra step for me. I think where it's all in Moodle, and then I have to take every, and there's a hundred students. I have to take everybody's submission and package it in a forum where it's in a directory that I can just go into and run their program. Uh, I thought this would be simple. Uh, if yes. They might, not be able to, they might not be able to find the directory because SCP has to come from your own machine. They're probably doing it in, like, after they've SSH'd. Oh, oh so you problem. didn't exit. Yeah. Was that the problem, Mackenzie? Because if you're in this no. environment, you need to actually be in the environment where your file is. Yeah, I don't think that was the issue. You had troubles just no, accessing Yeah, we were in our thing, and it could access, like, it could access my file code. It couldn't access the directory I was trying to put it in. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm guessing that was an internet connectivity issue. Maybe. It didn't. It, we tried it like 20 times last I know. night, but it was all like within 20 minutes. So. Because, so at about 3 or 4 in the morning, I couldn't access the web page intermittently. I couldn't SCP to the machine. I thought this was going to be a disaster. Um, and I thought of coming in and rebooting the server, but in the morning, everything was fine. So. Uh, but so just the other comment that someone made, uh, just explain what was going on here in the steps. The first step is you log on to the machine, create the directory. Then you log out, you type exit, and then you copy your file. Again, uh, I could have created directories for everybody, but then that would have been work for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't mean to complicate people's lives uh, about this. Any further questions on the submission part? Just submit it any time uh, you want uh, today or this weekend. Yeah. Sounds like the same Are you getting it now? No such file after I create it. Right now? Because I just succeeded, so what could be different? Let me see. Oh, oh, because there's no, you have to create a file code.c. Oh, I thought I did that up here. Isn't that it? Uh, but, uh, so, uh, big, uh, so the idea is that you should upload an actual file, so just create a text file called code.c and it should work. Okay, uh, this isn't helpful for me in front of a class to... Okay, uh, any further issues with the homework uh, s submission or not? Um, now, um, a few of you, I think I addressed this, all of this, but at least one or two students in the class late in the game told me that they really don't like programming uh, or they're not accustomed to it. And I'm sympathetic to that because uh, I advertised the course as one in which uh, programming wasn't required, and then this was a pretty programming-heavy assignment. So anybody who wasn't able to do the programming who, uh, and has a reason for not 
doing this. If you have a background in EE or computer science, I kind of won't accept that. But if you don't, uh, then I'm open for you to work on an alternate problem. I think there was only one student that, who I didn't respond to uh, that had that request. All right, any, anything else? Okay, let's return to our lecture. Uh, yes, uh, I'll, but how about it, because I think they're still maybe straggling in, I want to show you the solution for the last one, for the switches, the eight switches, and I also want to show you the solution for multiplication with the uh, C1 over C1 plus C2, because there's a solution for this that has only four reactions, and uh, all the reactions have the same rate, so very elegant solution. I want to show you both of those, but let me hold off in case there are still assignments straggling in. So I'll, I'll do that on Wednesday, I promise. Okay, for some reason, the mirroring of displays is causing difficulties. I'm reloading the file. So, but first, um, last time, so John asked a very good question, and his question, to paraphrase, was, uh, why is this interesting? Uh, in terms of um, the construct that I'm showing to, uh, for instance, compute the majority function using um, this particular paradigm of conditional permutations. So let's remind ourselves where we're at. So the first observation, or the first uh, attempt to answer the question, why is this interesting? Uh, I think it will be interesting, in essence, as a brain teaser as we proceed, because it really seems counterintuitive that uh, using uh, only a few bits of memory, so let's say three bits of memory, three binary digits, we can count numbers up to, uh, let's say, a thousand or even a million. Uh, it seems that if the only thing you're allowed to remember is a number between 0 and 7, 
it's impossible to count to high numbers. But as it turns out, it is. Uh, so as the, the brain teaser aspect of it, I hope, is still intriguing you a little bit. But here's why I think that this has uh, tremendous research potential. Let me try to explain. So the first distinction to make is between the size of a circuit that computes something and a data structure that represents the function that the circuit computes. So can anyone comment on this? Um, so uh, there is Scott, and there's also uh, Paul. So Paul, um, if you have a circuit that computes a function, let's say we talk about the number of variables that the function depends upon. Let's say it depends upon 1024 variables. What can you say about the size of the circuit? A priori. I know that's a completely open-ended question. I know. Let me try to draw. So here is just a generic circuit. Each triangle is meant to be a gate of some kind. Um, it, if it's a logic gate, there aren't so many possibilities, but that's just a generic gate. And here is a very generic circuit. It's structured as a complete binary tree, uh, in the sense that this is the root of the tree. And as the tree grows, it branches. It branches every time into two branches until we have the variables, which are the leaves of the tree. Um, and so here. The function that it computes will be a function of eight variables. And so, Paul, how many gates do we have here? Uh, eight uh, no, but physically on the screen. Pardon? Uh, what I'm asking for is actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just count the number of gates. Yeah. No, sorry. This, I phrase questions like there is something to answer when there isn't. So here, um, there are seven gates computing a function of eight variables. So it's true that if you have a tree, a binary tree, uh, you will have, in fact, more leaves to the tree than you have nodes in the tree beneath it. I think I've discussed that before. Does, that, does everybody know that fact? Um, if we were to continue building a binary tree that had 10,024 variables as the leaves, there would only be 10,023 uh, nodes beneath it. That's because the tree, the last, uh, the last row of a tree as it grows upwards contains more leaves than all the nodes beneath it. I think that I've discussed this before with the number of people who are alive today and the number of people who have ever lived and died in the past. Have any of you heard this? Have I talked about it? Okay, let's not waste time. So um, the point is that <laughs> Here, the function that we're computing is potentially a complicated function, however we define complexity. We've talked a little bit about data structures to represent functions. If we had here, uh, instead of x to the 8, if we went all the way up to x to the 1024, a function of 1024 variables now. This is a complicated function. To write the truth table for it, uh, we would require 2 to the 1024 rows to specify all combinations. And yet, the circuit to compute it might have only 10 to the 23 gates. So my point here is that a circuit that computes something can be immeasurably smaller than the representation we need for the function that it computes. And so now you might be thinking, well, none of this makes sense. Why don't we just use the circuit as our representation instead of the truth table. So any thoughts on that? So 
So Tor, what, like, I mean, why do, we, why do we ever teach you guys binary decision diagrams and truth tables? Why don't we just use the circuit if it's so much smaller? I don't know, that's why. <laughs> I think you should use the circuit if it's more compact. Assuming you get, assuming it's exhaustive and you don't lose any information. Right. You know, because you could have a circuit where you would need almost that, as much, you know, information yeah. in it. But you could yeah. impact it, you know, that's why decision diagrams are good, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so what's wrong with my, yeah, Mackenzie, sorry. Is it because the circuit itself doesn't change when the inputs change? That's, that's, a, uh, that's a good point. So the circuit itself is uh, what we use to evaluate the function. And my argument here is that evaluating the function is pretty simple. We put in the inputs and we just figure out what the gates compute, out pops the answer. But we don't really, by trying one possibility, two possibilities, we really don't know what the circuit computes for every possibility. The data structure has to capture the information of what it computes for every possibility. That's exactly your point, right? Uh, very good point. And um, the whole point of using a data structure, like a binary decision diagram, is we want to answer a question about a function or describe a property of the function. So consider uh, you were going to ask a question or say something, Scott? Is it because the circuit is not unique, uh, given one function? That's, th that's at the heart of it, that uh, the circuit uh, to represent a function is not unique. There can be many different circuits for it. So um, part of having a representation for the function of data structure is that it is a complete and presumably unique representation. Um, now think of the example that I gave where you were hired by Intel and you had to or you came up with your own circuit, there was the existing circuit, and the question was, do the same circuits compute the same function? The circuits themselves may be small. They may have 10 to the 23 gates. But the function they compute is, in principle, 2 to the, 20, 2 to the 1024 rows of a truth table to describe all possibilities. So how do you prove the two circuits are identical? This goes to the question of uniqueness. If you have a representation that's unique, so you can somehow represent your circuit in a unique way, then you can represent uh, both your circuits in that same way and check to see if they're identical. So that's, that's I'm beginning to describe why data structures are useful. Uh, they're more useful, or they're useful in other ways. Uh, when you're designing a circuit, you don't design the final circuit in one shot. You design the circuit bit by bit. You put together modules to create larger modules. And in doing so, uh, you need, or your computer program that's doing the synthesis, needs the function representation because you don't have the final circuit. So you need the representation to work with. OK. So um, returning to the topic of uh, chimpanzee computation. With chimpanzee computation here, what I'm proposing, what I'm going to explain is how we can construct a data structure uh, that represents uh, a very large function, potentially a function uh, of, let's say, a thousand variables. So could have a truth table that has size 2 to the 1024. So that's what you should focus on is um, the potential for the representation. Um, of it. And the representation, even we're going to require about a million instruction cards. A million instruction cards sounds like a lot when you could simply create a circuit that would count to the number of inputs and decide if half of them are one. But that's not a representation of it. Make sense, John? So can you clarify your question from last time? I appreciated your comment. This was good. No? no? OK. Um, That said, this is the answer that I attempted to give last time. Uh, the original reason why I started looking at this particular data structure uh, was, from a computer science perspective, interest in the data structure itself. But I think it has research potential because I think that the structure itself could be used uh, to create a circuit, a highly pipelined circuit. So I'll return to that at the end. But let's return to the topic and let me actually explain to you how this is done. Uh, any thoughts how it's done based upon what I said last time? Mackenzie, where the gear is turning a little bit on how instruction cards that tell you how to permute uh, your state, how you can begin to 
compute a function like majority? I'm not sure right now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so just to remind you guys the context, the chimpanzee can uh, be in one of seven states. Each instruction card uh, tells the chimpanzee to go look at a particular bucket, look inside the bucket and see if there's a grape. If there is a grape, that means that the variable corresponding to the bucket has value one. If there's no grape, it has value zero. So for each value, either zero or one, and for each state the chimpanzee can be in, let's say S1 through S8, the instruction card tells him what state to go to. So the instruction card just contains 16 rows if we have uh, eight states. Eight states, eight states. So here S1 through S8 and where we go to, S1 through S8 and where we go to. Okay. So Translating this, I'm repeating a little bit of what I said last time, translating this into a binary decision diagram, this means that our binary decision diagram has a very regular structure. It means that in each row, which corresponds to an instruction card, we reference the same variable. So here notice that x1 is the only variable in this row, x3, x2, x1, as we look at it. Each column metaphorically represents the state that we're in. So as we drop our particular marble, it bounces around, and the column that it's in at a given step is the state. So the number of columns that we have corresponds to the number of states. In the previous slide, I kept saying eight. Here I'm saying four. The final value we'll use is five. Um, and each instruction card or each row uh, describes where you go to if you're in that node based upon the value of the variable. So there are two possibilities for every node. So we'll call this a pair of conditional permutations. So uh, your name is Alex. I don't know why I have troubles with that. So Alex, what do I mean by a conditional permutation? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, anyone else? It'll permute um, if a given condition is met. Yeah. If it's not, it'll stay the same. Or maybe permute a different way. So perfect. Um, the permutation is a shuffling. So if I have uh, five objects or four objects laid out on the table, a permutation is a shuffle. A valid permutation is to not shuffle them, you know, just keep them as it is, but that's a permutation. So if you think of it this way, uh, based upon the value of the variable xi, if it's one, we've got a bunch of solid lines. The solid lines tell us from each column which column to go to, so it's a shuffle. The dotted lines tell us where to go to if the value of the variable is zero. That's also a shuffle. So we've got a pair of shuffles. This is, it's a conditional permutation. Uh, it's conditional based upon the value of the variable that we access. So that's how we, I'll begin talking about permutations in, and shuffling permutations instead of binary decision diagrams. And I'm talking about binary decision diagrams instead of chimpanzee computation. So I hope I'm not losing people. So the point that I ended on last time was that uh, there's no reason based upon the structure that I've described so far that we have to restrict ourselves to cyclic permutations. But for the construct, we'll restrict ourselves to cyclic permutations. So Alex, what is a cyclic permutation? Uh -huh. But in what sense? Because it's a shuffle. So, uh, like a, and it's just a single shuffle. So what does it mean that a single shuffle is cyclic? Just a single shuffle is cyclic? Yeah. The sequence of shuffles is cyclic? Oh, but in this case, we can say that just a single shuffle can be cyclic or not. So this one is not cyclic, as indicated with the big X. Why? So, anyone? Yeah? Um, does it mean, uh, do you mean that uh, if you do the cyclic uh, permutation, you will bring it back to the, uh, to the previous uh, buckets? <coughs> Uh, no? no? Uh, anyone else? Uh, Ryan. I'm guessing the cyclic shuffle is if you do that cyclic shuffle multiple times, you end up in the same spot? You would. If you did it, uh, in this case, four times, you'd end up at the same spot. But there's a simpler kind of definition yet, John? Well, just from the, you see one goes to four and four goes to yeah. one. Yeah. So, so it's like... 
So not creating pairs. It's, not, it's, it's creating islands. We're not going to create a cyclic permutation as one in which there are no islands. There's just one continent of Pangaea. So um, one goes to four, four goes to one, and two goes to three, three goes to two. That's two separate islands. A cyclic permutation would be one in which that doesn't happen. So here, one goes to four, four goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to one. Uh, it's cyclic in that sense. And the notation that I'll begin using heavily is I'll just write it as a list. So here when I write in parentheses 1, 4, 2, 3, what I mean is 1 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 1. It's just a convenient way to write it. Okay. So uh, here then is the structure of conditional permutations corresponding to this binary decision diagram. Um, if x equals 1, that's the first row, then we perform the permutation 1, 2, 3, 4. In this case, uh, if x1 is 0, we perform the identity permutation. In the slides that come, I think I use 15 different symbols for identity. So here I'm using um, phi. Is, what is this? This is... Uh, phi. I think I also use I and I use E. What else do I use? Anyways, I use a bunch of uh, symbols for identity. That's just my bad. I should have picked one and chosen. But everybody understands what the identity permutation it is. There's no way I can represent it as a list of numbers in parentheses. We'll call the identity permutation a cyclic permutation. Uh, it's just the way things are structured. Okay. So here is a simpler way to write things. Um, I'll just write each row as a variable and then a pair of permutations, the one that you take when the variable is 0 and then the one you take when the variable is 1. Right. So uh, that's for a single row. But how can, how can we pair up the meaning of a function with the meaning of a decision diagram here. Or uh, the function that we're interested in will be a function of the variables, x1 through however many variables we have. And it's just a binary decision diagram. So if we drop the marble and we follow where it goes, it lands in one of the buckets. That's what the function evaluates to. So what do I mean here if I ascribe uh, a value of 0 or 1 corresponding to uh, a permutation. So what do I mean here? Alex, you're falling asleep. How can I wake you up? How are you going to upload everything? Uh, so if this is going to be difficult, then let's, uh, let me just help you with it. Just email it to me. Not everyone, but if it's really giving you trouble. But... <laughs> What's the question again? Um, so, So here, yeah. Can we do the composition of multiple functions? Yeah, exactly. So I'm just trying to get people to think about the representation here. There's nothing profound, but it's a Boolean function. The decision diagram represents it. And yet what I'd like to say is the function evaluates to 1 or 0 based upon if, because what I want to move to, and I'll move to in a second, Will be, I won't even write down the decision diagram. I'll just write down a set of lines like what I have on the right-hand side. And then I'd like to say, all right, this program, and we'll call it a continu uh, conditional permutation program, it's just a list of instructions like this, computes a function. But it computes a function in what sense or how? Jack? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's not up yet, Tor. So the function is just you have inputs and you put them into the function and you get an output. So we have like the same thing here, right? Right. Uh, elaborate a little bit more. So, yeah. so, if we, so you could just follow through if you have values for x1 through 4 here. You can start with x1, whether or not it's 1 or yeah, 0, yeah. and just kind of follow it all the way through and then get your output at the end. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that's what I'm going for, but uh, I'm just not phrasing the question right. What I mean to say here is for this particular diagram, exactly like Tor said, suppose that I uh, 
and take my marble. My marble is always connected to the first one. I drop it into the first note. It bounces around, and at the end, it lands. So let's forget about the. Let's ignore the buckets for the time being and just focus on where it pops out、uh, at the very end. So let's say I drop it into. The one node, and it bounces around, and it comes out at the three node. And then let's say instead of the one node, I, in practice, I never have to do this. But let's say I would drop a marble into the two node at the top, and it bounces around and it lands in the five node. It comes out of the five column. Then let's say I drop a marble into the three column, and it bounces around, and then I see that. Lands in the two column. I drop one in the two column. It lands in the five column. The five column and the four column. So, in other words, if I do the test dropping a marble in a given column, I watch to see what column it comes out, and、uh, it does so based upon a particular assignment of the variables. So, I'll say that here the BDD computes one, three, two, five. If I drop a marble in column one and ends up in column three. If I drop it in column three, it ends up in two. If I drop it in column two, it ends in five, five, four, four, one. For this particular decision diagram, some of the examples I'll show you. It computes the one goes to three, three goes to two, two goes to five, five goes to four, four goes to one type of permutation when the corresponding Boolean function evaluates to one. It computes the identity permutation, which means one goes to one. Two goes to two, three goes to three, four goes to four, five goes to five. When the function evaluates to zero, so keep in mind that the overall goal is to represent a Boolean function, a function that evaluates to zero and one based upon va- variables that evaluate to zero and one. The function for a given assignment of zeros and ones either evaluates to zero or one. The structure、uh, for any given assignment of variables computes a permutation, and it'll be our decision how we assign the permutation it computes. To be the zero or one case, or rather, that's our interpretation. Is this making sense, or am I confusing people? Jason, am I confusing people? Yeah. Well, I'm a little confused. Just I understand when you say that the decision diagram can yield one, three, two, five. Yeah. I get that, but then how do you go from that to the total outcome of zero or one? Yeah, that's a good question. So what I'm going to do in practice is I'm going to say here it's going to be. St- The decision diagram has to be structured in a specific way. It's going to be structured in a way such that if the function evaluates to zero, it will always yield the identity.、Okay. So that means that if I were to drop the marble in the one column, and I'll only drop the marble in the one column, but if I were to drop it in the one column, and the function should evaluate to zero, it means that I'll land in the zero bucket. That will correspond to the identity permutation because one went to one. Now, if the function evaluates to one, then if I drop the marble in the one, it'll bounce around and it'll always land in the three. And if it lands in the three, I map the three to the one. So, because I'm going to forget about the binary decision diagram interpretation, but in practice, I only have to tie two output nodes to zero or one.、Uh, I have to tie the one output node in the one column to zero, <coughs> and whatever one goes to to one. And that's how it'll interpret. Yeah, Tor. So why do you need multiple rows? Like, couldn't you、yeah. just evaluate one, three, two, five, four in a single row? I mean, that's what's confusing me still. You could. So instead of a big decision diagram, you could just build one. But the point is, we're going to build a decision diagram that implements a function like majority. So you say it should yield it, but like I mean, we'll have a thousand variables that it has to look at before it decides whether half of them are one or zero. But、uh, ask your question again. It's a good I, question. Well, yeah, I guess I'm still confused about like the BDD yielding、yeah. this. It seems like the the way you've set up the notation, the way I'm seeing it, is that just corresponds to like a single row. But you have that. It does. As so, you kind of say if we have one, then you follow the dark line the whole time, and if we have zero, then you follow the dotted line through the whole thing. Am I getting that right? You are, but I, I think I know what the confusion is. Let me give an example. But first,、uh, okay, energy drink. But I know how to. I've I've prepared for my energy drink break. Since we're talking about chimpanzee computation, fortunately.
question. I've got to go through this. That was a heavy sigh, Jason. Oh. Oh. Scott. <laughs> Extraordinary breakthroughs in communication between men and animals. Some outstanding cases being those with dolphins and with owls. But in the forefront of this field is Professor Timothy Fielding Tim. and his experiments with a gorilla called Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, can Gerald really speak as we would understand it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, he can speak a few actual words. Of course, it was extremely difficult to get him even to this stage. Um, <laughs> when I first... Uh, when I first captured Gerald in the Congo, I'm 67, I think it was. I... 68. <laughs> 68. Um, there was an awful lot of work to do. He was enormously slow and difficult. I had to do a lot of work with him on a sort of one-to-one -one basis. Yes. If I might just butt in at this point, Tim, I think I should point out that I have done a considerable amount of work on this project myself, and if I may say so, your teaching methods do leave a bit to be desired. That's a little bit ungrateful, isn't it? And your, your diction, for instance, is I'm not... Sorry, really I'm sorry, can I put this into some sort of perspective? When I caught Gerald in 68, <clears throat> he was completely wild. Wild? I was absolutely livid. I mean, <laughs> such a, such a Clearly, all that's changed now. Yes. Yeah, because, yeah. of course, you've been brought up in, in the professor's own house. Yes, he's living with me, yes. Um... Though not in the biblical sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was going to ask you, actually, Gerald, do, do you have a mate? Yeah, I've got lots of mates. Um, <laughs> there's, the, uh, there's the professor, there's uh, his son, Toby, there's, uh, there's Raymond and, uh, next door. Well, no, actually... Uh... Oh, I see. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, Crumpet. Crumpet. <laughs> You didn't tell me you were friendly with Raymond. <laughs> well, do I have to tell you everything? To come back to my earlier question, um, how has Gerald reacted to being separated from his family? Well, to begin with, Gerald did make various attempts to contact his old flange of gorillas. It's a whoop, but... Professor, a whoop of gorillas. It's a flange of baboons. He sent them the occasional letter, but I couldn't really see the point. I mean, they either ate them or wiped their bottoms on them. I mean, <laughs> Look, I know you've never got on with my mother. Well, she didn't exactly like me, did she? She got, she got on perfectly well with David Attenborough. David Attenborough! All I ever hear is David bloody Attenborough. Let me Dave out of this, Sidney. Oh, shut up and have a banana. All something. right, I will. Uh, if I could interrupt for a minute. Uh, uh, Gerald, I believe you've been earning some money doing TV commercials and so on. What do you spend your earnings on? Um, well, I... <laughs> I, um, I suppose you'd expect... So, uh, to address Tor's question, which is uh, a permutation seems to be something that happens in a given row. What does it mean to have a permutation uh, that spans multiple rows? Was that sort of your question? Okay, let me explain. So. What I need here, okay, we'll stick with columns one, two, three, four, five. The permutation will permute the columns. If I wasn't lazy, I would use different symbols. What would be helpful here would be, imagine I had five objects, uh, star, smiley face, frowny face, so forth, and then the permutation would describe how I shuffle them. But I'm going to be lazy. I hope it won't confuse people. All right, so suppose here I have the permutation one, two, three, four, five. This means that 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes to 5, 5 goes to 1. That's the shuffling. Suppose here I've got the permutation 1, 3, 5, 4, 2. That means that 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 5, 5 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 1. Oh, how did I mess that up? Let me start again. I know, I know, but <laughs> this is trivial. So one goes to three, three goes to four, four goes to five, five goes to one, one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, four goes to one, and one goes to two. Okay, so I'm going to 
3 goes to 5, 5 goes to 4, 4 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 1. Okay. So now, but this is what we'll begin to see. How do we multiply permutations? So what I can write, and I'll begin writing this, is I'll write 1, 2, I'll write one, two 3, 4, 5 multiplied by 1, 3, 5, 4, 2. What's this equal to? Well, it's, any guesses? So Torah, what's this equal to? Oh, I don't have to draw it out. Well, I guess. So 1, one goes. Five, two, uh, am I doing this right? 4 and then 3? Uh, well, here, 1 goes to 1. So, okay, so shift all those actually, so I chose, and you'll see in a moment, this one doesn't work. Okay, let's pick a better one. <laughs> and, well, because this will come to the heart of it. So it's always valid to multiply permutations. But multiplying two cyclic permutations doesn't always yield a cyclic permutation. And I want it to yield a cyclic permutation. So how about if I multiply it by... Uh, one, five, four, three, two. So can you guess what this will yield? Uh, I would want to draw it. <laughs> it just shifts. It just two is on one again. Yeah, so it's still one to one. But it actually will be cyclic according to the definition I gave. Yeah, so what do I mean by that? It's the identity. It's the identity. Why is it the identity? How can you tell it's the identity? Just read it backwards. One, two, three, four, five. If I read it backwards, is one, two, three, four, five. So here, if one goes to five, and five goes to four, and four goes to three, and three goes to two, and then two goes to one, then if I start at one, I end up at one. If I start at two, I end up at two, three, four, five. Okay, so this will yield whatever symbol I'm using, identity. But in general, now, if I start to stack a lot of these together, so if we look at a program, I have it here. So if I start to stack a lot of these together, then for a given assignment, so suppose that I want to evaluate this for um, x1 equals 0, x2 equals 1, x3 equals 0, and x4 equals 1. Then what will this evaluate to in terms of permutations, Tor? Uh, sorry, I'm kind of tracing through it. Uh, but, yeah. But let's, not, let's just use the notation of permutations. So this will evaluate to identity times... 1, 3, 2, 4 times identity times 1, 4, 2, 3, right? So this is how the conditional part comes in. We've got a pair of permutations. Depending upon the variable, we either bounce to the first or to the second. But what we're doing is from top to bottom, we're performing a sequence of shuffles. And we can talk about the overall shuffle that's performed simply by following where things bounce around to. So, uh, Jason, is it making more sense now that for the programs that we're going to write, we'll talk about how a sequence of continu uh, conditional permutations computes a Boolean function in terms of the permutation it computes when the function evaluates to 1 and the permutation it computes when the function evaluates to 0. Um, and you may be saying, well, does it always compute, this is a question, does it always compute the same permutation or not when the function evaluates to 1? Not necessarily, right? Why not, Tori? Because your inputs can be different. They can be different, and so you can bounce around in different ways based upon the inputs. You bounce around in different ways, you get a different sequence of permutations that you multiply, and potentially you get a different permutation at the output. But we'll structure the computation such that the computation always yields um, a particular permutation when the function evaluates to 1, and it always yields the identity when the function evaluates to 0. We'll have to do work to structure it that way. Okay, am I losing people? If so, then ask. Yeah. 
Okay, here are some examples. Um, so how do we multiply permutations? I should have started with this instead of going on the screen. But if we have two permutations, A and B, multiplying them is we follow the sequence. One goes to two, then two goes to three. So overall, one goes to three. Two goes to three, and three goes to five. So overall, uh, two goes to five, and so forth. Sometimes when we multiply cyclic permutations, we get a cyclic permutation, not always. Of course, for the identity permutation, uh, multiplying it by the identity permutation just gives us the permu same permutation. And for every permutation, there's an inverse permutation. And if we multiply the permutation by its inverse, we get identity. So what is this starting to sound like? Has anyone taken a course on discrete math? It's starting to sound like an algebra, or it's starting to sound like a ring, a field. What's it starting to sound like? Linear algebra? No, no, not linear algebra. Uh, discrete math? Anyone? Finite fields. Uh, finite fields. It's starting to sound. So what is a field, uh, Jordan? It's a place where crops grow. Right? <laughs> I, 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 yeah. It actually has a very specific and very interesting mathematical meaning. So um, a field, a discrete field, uh, or even an infinite field, is simply a place where you have the operations of multiply, uh, addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division being valid. So you can think of examples where this is true. It's true uh, for the integers. Uh, no, it's not. But it's true for the real numbers. It's true for uh, the rational numbers. As it turns out, for finite fields, you can define finite fields where that is true. Uh, finite fields consisting only of integers where that's true. Anyways, we won't get into any of that. But I'm going to attempt to show you how we can cons compute the majority function. All right, so how do we do this, John? Not enough? No. So uh, I'll need an example for this. The first uh, step that we'll need to prove, well, actually, let me flip to the outcome. Because there are different ways of presenting this, and it can easily come across as very, very complicated. And so let me start by showing you uh, everything you need to know in one slide, basically. Uh, because when I presented this in the past, so a bit of context here, uh, this is a research topic that I return to when I teach the course, and every time I'm excited, I want to pursue it, but I haven't made much headway on it. Uh, but it stems from a PhD dissertation that I read, and I'll post the link for it, uh, that contained this result, basically, in a very cryptic form. It was a PhD dissertation from someone at MIT um, in theoretical computer science, and it is the worst written document. Uh, I, I can produce this as an example of horrible, horrible writing, not because there is horrible grammar in it, but this result is buried in the dissertation in the most incomprehensible form. He's, in his entire dissertation, he published a paper based upon the dissertation. He describes this result, and he doesn't give a single example. So he just talks about finite fields, and he talks, talks about cyclic permutations being non-solvable, all this jargon. And he doesn't ever write down an example. And as it turns out, if you write down the example, uh, it all fits on one screen. And it becomes, uh, in a sense, I think, very manageable to explain. We'll see how well I do. So here, suppose that I start with a set of these five permutations, A through E, written there. I've chosen these for a specific reason. Not every choice of permutations would have this property. But this choice of five permutations has the property that, first of all, if we write down the inverses, this is written here, so we have A inverse, B inverse, C inverse, D inverse, and E inverse. So the apostrophe is the inverse. Does everybody see that? If I have 1, 4, 3, 5, 2, the inverse is 1, 4, 3, 5, 2. I just read it backwards. This set has a remarkable property. The property is that if uh, I take any one of the permutations in the set of 10, actually. I'll consider the 5 and the 5. I can obtain each one of those as an operation on two others. That operation, we'll give it a name. We'll call it the commutation operation. It's uh, to take 
the pair, so A is equal to CB times C inverse B inverse. And uh, well, what does it mean to say that the operation of commutation is closed on this set of permutations? It's a bit of jargon, but maybe helpful. So what do I mean by that, Paul? It means that if you do the operation on any <coughs> part you use, two elements, uh, and do the operation, you always produce an element that's also Perfect. the same group. I can't say that any better, so I won't, even though I should for the Unite students. Um, so an operation being closed on a set simply means that if you take two elements from the set, perform the operation, the result is an element that's in the set. And that sounds boring when you're talking about uh, things like integers. Of course that's true. What else could it be? But in this case, we're interested in cyclic permutations from a very specific set of 10. And it's not at all obvious that if we perform this operation, which is to take permutation, permutation, inverse, inverse, multiply them all together, that the result is always one of the elements from the set. And you can take any pair. So you could take C and E, and the result would be some permutation in the set. You could take E and A inverse, and it would be some element in the set. No matter how much you do this commutation operation, you always get an element in the set. And that, as it turns out, is going to be critical for our construction. And um, as it turns out, this set is not unique. But you can't find a set of cyclic permutations of length less than 5 that has this property that is closed under commutation. So 5 is the minimum number. And it turns out for our chimpanzee brain, it means that we're going to require 5 states or 5 columns in our binary decision diagram. So permutations of length 5. All right. Um, so this is a leap. because uh, So let me go through some examples. So here is an example of commutation. I've got a couple, I think. So uh, here's A, here's B, two cyclic permutations. Let's take the commutation of them. So what does that mean? I hope everybody understands. Well, I've written it out here. So I've written out A, B, A inverse, B inverse. I'm claiming that this is uh, a new permutation, which I'll call C. I guess let me just step through the example so everyone understands. Here's how I do it. Um, so how do I figure out what the multiplication of these four permutations is? I go, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 5, uh, 5 goes to 3. So the overall result is 1 goes to 3. OK, Jordan? You're squinting a little bit. I, I try to interpret facial expressions. Does, does this make sense? A little bit. Is it kind of like matrix multiplication? It is. This kind of its own. Okay. It is, but okay. I just I hope everybody understands the mechanics of what I'm saying here. All right. So I figured out that one goes to three. That's the overall result of multiplying these. So next, three goes to four. Four goes to two. Two goes to one. One goes to two. So the overall result is three goes to two. Two goes to three. Three goes to one. 1 goes to 5, 5 goes to 3, so the overall result. How did I mess that up? <laughs> I thought I was good at this. 3 goes to 2, uh, so I'm at 2. 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 5, 5 goes to 4, 4 goes to 5, so 2 goes to 5. One more. Uh, 5 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2, 2 goes to 4, so 5 goes to 4. Actually, one more to verify that it's actually cyclic. It has to be at this point. but. Um, so starting at 4, 4 goes to 5, 5 goes to 4, 4 goes to 3, 3 goes to 1, so 4 goes to 1. So the result is a cyclic permutation. That's the first observation. The next is that I'll call this C. So here's a question. This, uh, I'll have to send you guys this uh, PhD dissertation. It's by David Barrington. And I really hope that he never clicks on the videos and watches the slides of me teaching this because I disparage his writing so harshly. This is actually, I think, an incredibly profound result. He's now a professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, but in his dissertation, he just doesn't give an example of this. And so reading it through, you kind of, oh, well, what are these cyclic permutations and these groups and these fields? So here's a question for you. And you'll actually have to do this on a homework. How would you generate this set here?
So how would you generate the set that I showed you? So here was the, the set. How would you generate this? Anyone? Yes, Ryan. You mean just find a set? A set, a set that, that is closed, closed under commutation, yeah. I would just brute force, I guess, and you can simulate it. Figure yeah. It turns out it's remarkably easy. That basically, you just pick the first two and then generate a new one. So pick A, B, and in this case, I think it gives you, what is A, B? So if you pick um, A and B, uh, it'll give you, and you take the commutation of A and B, you get E prime. So then now you've got three. You've got A, B, and E prime. Take the commutation of all those three. Take the commutation of A and E prime, B and E prime. Uh, so in other words, take what you have in the set, which your new one, take the commutation. It'll yield. Uh, I haven't listed them all here, but it'll yield another one. And just keep going. Keep going until uh, every operation that you've tried from elements in the pair gives you one that's already in the set, and the set is closed. So it turns out it's remarkably easy to generate such a set that's closed under commutation. All right. Now, given such a set that's closed under commutation, how am I going to use this to implement a circuit? This is the big leap here. And just let's keep things simple. Um, so the goal will be to implement the circuit. I'm talking about the majority function, and I haven't told you how to build a circuit that computes the majority function. But let's just suppose we have any circuit, and suppose it's a really stupid circuit. It consists of a single AND gate. So Tor, how would you create a conditional permutation program on a pair of variables x and y such that the overall result is the AND of x and y? What, are, are X and Y just Booleans here? Yep, they're just the Boolean. You're just building an AND gate, but in my funny notation. I just, I'm prodding you guys to think about, because this is for the dissertation and the brilliant result, I think it is brilliant, that David Barrington had. I think this was the whole essence of his observation, that it'll actually take us four conditional permutations to implement the AND operation. So. What four operations? Jacob, is it coming slowly? I want to get through this. Will permutations only have two elements rather than five? Ah, uh, no. So we're, we're actually, and so let's use uh, these, these uh, permutations, A through E. But how do I write down? the BDD, or the program, that computes AND. Yeah, I, I think I've confused people here. I wish I hadn't. So Jacob, come in. Make it so that if both of them are true, or no, if, yeah. well, if either of them are false, then you get the identity. And, yeah. And if both of them are true, then you don't. So perfect. But how do we do that? Yeah, that's where <laughs> But so let's just, uh, and for this, this is the essence of the commutation operation. So uh, if you look at CB, C inverse, B inverse, what does that suggest? Okay, so suppose that I have this program. I'm telling you the solution, uh, where this is my program, or I could translate it into a binary decision diagram in the way that I described. But it's just four instructions, four rows, four instruction cards for the chimpanzee. My claim is that this implements the AND operation. So this corresponds to the function that's the AND of x and y. 
So why? When is the AND function 1? When both variables are 1. So if x and y are 1, I'm going to follow the second permutation in each clump. And so the overall result will be, uh, so how can I write this? If x equals 1, y equals, let me create a table. x, y, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So in the 1, 1 case, what sequence of permutations will I perform? Well, I'll perform this, the permutation A, B, A inverse, B inverse, right? Why? Because I'll follow this column, A, B. And this, we look it up in the table. This happens to be something. Where is it? It's E prime. So it means that the overall result that I get here is equal to E prime. All right, it's some shuffle. So I had some, I had the columns and I shuffled them according to whatever E prime is. Uh, one goes to five, three goes to four, two goes. What's it going to be in all the other cases and why? If either of them are zero, then that means that um, like either, either it's going to be A and then identity and then A inverse and then identity. Perfect. Or... So let's deal with the simple case for zero, zero is simply Identity times identity times identity times identity. That's obviously equal to identity. If I do nothing, and I do nothing, I do nothing, then I've done nothing. Um, what if I have 0 and 1? That means that I'll do nothing. Then I'll do B. Then I'll do nothing. And then I'll do B inverse. Well, what does this evaluate to? I do B, but then I'm going to undo B with B inverse. So this evaluates to nothing. If I do A... Uh, nothing, and then A inverse, and then nothing, then I've done nothing. So in three of the four cases, I do nothing. In one of the four cases, I do something, E prime. That's how this particular sequence of four instructions evaluates to the AND function. Does everybody see that? Okay. So now, suppose that I've got uh, a circuit that computes a function. How can I create a conditional permutation program from it? Let me, I will be running out of time, so let me go to the example. But first, I'll let you read this. Are we getting smiles at least? It's one of my favorite cartoons. OK, uh, I'm going to jump right into this, even though I do have to tell you guys one more thing. How do we implement the not function? Jacob, how do we? So this is how we do and. And then as it turns out, if we know how to do and and we know how to do not, then we can do any circuit. Because our assumption is that we'll transform our entire circuit to a circuit that consists of NAND gates or and and NAND gates. So if we can do and, all we need to figure out is how to do not. But how do we do not? If you just have one variable that you're notting, then um, if it's uh, 0, then you do the permutation that's not the identity. And if it's 1, you do the one that is the identity. Perfect. So, and that's simple. It's too simple in the case of a single variable. Because if we have, so let's say we had, because you have to not something. If you have a single variable, the way to not the variable is you simply have it compute, uh, ident if you have it compute anything you want, let's say C, or identity. So if the variable is 0, you have it compute something that's not identity. If the variable is 1, you have it compute identity. So you just flip the convention of permutation versus identity for a single variable. But here is the question, and I think this is what I had in the slides that I flashed through. Suppose that, um, okay. suppose that I want to create a NAND gate now, because it's more meaningful, a single variable, we can just do it this way. But suppose that I want to create a NAND gate. So what is a NAND gate? It's going to be the AND operation followed by negation. So how can we do that here? Here is 
Uh, this is just what we stepped through before. This is how we do the AND operation. This is going to be A, B, A inverse, B inverse. And stupidly enough, on these slides, I've flipped everything around so that the one case comes first, then the zero case. Sorry. Uh, so this is just AND. How can we do NAND? How can we do the NOT of this? Suppose that we have A, B, and it computes, let's just suppose that it computes C for simplicity. We have A, B, A, B, uh, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, and suppose that A, B, A inverse, B inverse gives us C. How can we transform this so that instead the function that it computes is going to be uh, NAND? I'm somehow confusing people because I think you should be spotting this. Maybe not. M multiply by C, perfect. Uh, we'll multiply actually by C inverse. Wonderful. Uh, but where do we multiply by C inverse? But the end, wonderful. So that's and. So suppose that this is C inverse. It is in the example if I were to show you the slide. So this is C inverse. What I'm including here, this is dumb, but I'm including a dummy row. It's a dummy row I put nothing or star, meaning that I multiply the, the sequence of permutations by the same thing in both cases. So in both cases. I don't know if that's helpful. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if we follow the one case, we do this times this times this times this, which gives us C, times this, which gives us C inverse. The overall result is identity. Any other combination, by the time we get here, we have identity. So if we multiply identity by C inverse, we get C inverse. So the overall result is a sequence of permutations that computes the NAND function of x and y, returning C inverse when the NAND is 1, and returning identity when NAND is 0. But what can we do here, Jesse? How can we simplify this? How can we simplify How can we get rid of that last row? Combine it with the previous row. Why? Because this is not a conditional permutation. We always do this. So let's just multiply this entry and this entry by these two entries. And so multiplying those two entries together will shorten our program to this. I've just multiplied the previous entries by identity or by what was there. So now this is a set of four instructions that gives us the NAND function. And so I guess I'll have to continue this next time, but Suppose, just let me sh flash through the example. If, if it doesn't make sense, it'll at least perhaps keep your mind working. Uh, so now suppose I've got a function. It's a function that I've broken down into AND operations and NOT operations. So I want to take the NAND of x and z with ANDed with the NAND of x prime and y prime. That's my overall function. How can I begin to write a conditional permutation program on this? So Jacob, where would you begin? I've got to flash through it. So let me flash through it, and I'll go through it again next time. But what we can begin by saying is, let's just take the overall function and decide uh, a priori that the overall function will compute A if it evaluates to 1, and identity if it doesn't. So let's just pick A. So far, I've done nothing. I've written the entire function as one instruction. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand each instruction until instead of a function, which is the condition, I'm going to have a variable that's the condition. So to expand it, I'm just going to do what I did previously, starting with the outermost operation, which is the AND operation. So I'll look up in my table what pair of permutations, when commuted, gives me A. I forgot what that was, but it's coming up. So I can go with C and B. C times B times C inverse times B inverse gives me A. So now I've broken down the two into xz prime, xz prime, that's substituting for x, my and operation, and x prime, y prime, prime, x prime, y prime, prime, substituting for y. So here I'm just taking the and of what previously was x and y, but instead it's still a function. But I've expanded it. And so now I just continue where each instruction, I continue to expand it in this way. I know how to do the and operation, so what comes next? Well, why don't we do the and operation of the first line, x and z? So that'll give us this. I've just expanded the first line to xz, uh, xz, 
expanded together, and here I'm taking the NAND of it, so I'm multiplying everything by uh, the overall expression by C, because this gives me C inverse times C gives me identity versus C. And then I continue doing this. I'll go through it again next time. But I continue doing this and this and this, expanding everything until finally I've got my full conditional permutation program just in terms of variables and lines. So the overall function I'm claiming here uh, for values of x, y, and z, if I substitute them here, where I do the one permutation versus the zero permutation, the overall result will be a permutation that computes a, if the function evaluates to one, or evaluates to identity if it doesn't. And this is going to be the heart of the construct. Okay, I'll take this up on Wednesday.